So there you go. Um, lots of questions uh, about uh, the allegations in Parliament today. It did feel, didn't it, that two uh, interviews there and no specific uh, ideas uh, for what should change going forward. Well, let's move on to some uh, other uh, subjects now, uh, shall we? Uh, Vladimir Putin's war on Ukraine is grinding on relentlessly. His forces continue to take land in the Donbass, despite the brave resistance uh, there. In response, NATO leaders have approved a huge increase in high readiness forces. They're also going to be deploying more troops to Eastern Europe. And that's led to a debate here over whether it's time for us to spend more on our defence and what we should spend it on. Well, I'm pleased to say we're now uh, joined uh, by the former Chief of the Defence Staff, Lord Richard Dannett. Thank you very much for being with us uh, this morning. Sophie, good morning. I'm delighted to be here. Great. Well, we're delighted to have you. Um, it felt like the beginning uh, of the war uh, was really dominated by stories of Ukrainian success and Russia failing to meet their aims, whether it was taking Kyiv or uh, so on. But now, is it right that that feels like it's turning and that actually Russia is making steady, gruelling progress, but still progress in the East? Is, is Russia now winning the war? Um, no, I wouldn't say Russia is winning the war. It all depends what... Uh... Russia's objectives are considered to be. I mean, your analysis is absolutely right. At the start, the Ukrainians did extremely well. The Russians were woefully inept as far as their military is concerned, and they realized that their desired lightning strike from Belarus to Kyiv just was not going to happen. That was a shambles, and that episode, that chapter finished. And then they started what we've been seeing working out over the last few weeks and months, this relentless grind in the Donbass to take Donetsk province and Luhansk province and to join up with the land corridor that the Russians have achieved already from Crimea through Mariupol to, to Donbass. But um, the Russian tactics and the Russian way of doing business has completely changed since that early failed attack. They're relying on their huge superiority uh, in artillery, pounding the provinces of Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, and then once they've almost reduced everything to rubble, then sending their troops in to, uh, to take possession of it. And we're going to see that slow grind continue. Um, they very nearly achieved uh, taking Luhansk province, and then they will turn their sights to trying to get the control of Donetsk. Now, I think probably what we've seen over the last few weeks shows that over the next few days and weeks, they will probably achieve that. And at that stage, I believe the Russians will be exhausted. They won't have won the war, but they'll have achieved some of what they wanted to achieve, getting those two Donbass provinces. The Ukrainians will also be exhausted. Um, so the Russians won't have won, the Ukrainians won't have lost. And at that point, uh, I believe that the war will effectively go in the deep, into the deep freeze. And that's where meaningful negotiations are going to have to start. Well, that, in a way, is where the big questions begin too. If, as you say, it's almost inevitable that Russia ends up taking those two provinces in the Donbass, what then should the international community do? Uh, should we accept that Russia holds on to the territory it takes in return for peace? Well, it's interesting you put the question that way. We shouldn't do anything in terms of deciding what should happen. Um, this has got to be the Ukrainians deciding what is going to happen. The worst outcome for the West, for those of us who have been supporting Ukraine, is for us to apply pressure on the Ukrainians to come up with some kind of compromise, some kind of deal with Russia, and for the Ukrainians then to criticise, would be justifiably criticised, the West for saying, well, you sold us short. What we absolutely have to do in the West is continue to support Ukraine unequivocally, continue uh, pouring in weapons and ammunition, which we're doing, and it's up to President Zelensky and the Ukrainians to decide what negotiations they want to have uh, with the Russians. And the fact of the matter is, if one looks at it objectively, is that once the Russians have captured, as I suggest they will, the two provinces of Donetsk and Luhansk completely, and have got that land corridor, the world might tell them to go, but the Russians will not go, uh, and nobody can make them go. The Russians won't go voluntarily. The Ukrainians will not be strong enough to throw them out. And of course, the West, NATO, has got no intention whatsoever of mounting a Kuwait-type sort of expulsion operation, such as we did uh, to get rid of Saddam Hussein's forces um, from Kuwait. That's just not going to happen. So the new reality is that the sovereign territory of Ukraine probably is going to be occupied to about 20% by Russian troops. And that's the accommodation that the Ukrainians have got to get their head around. They must get their head around it. We mustn't make them put their head around it.
That's really interesting because, in a way, I've kind of wrongly thought of this as, as a decision moment uh, for Ukraine or for you know the international community, whatever. That you either decide to uh, Russia is going to keep this uh, land uh, or you're going to try and repel Russia. But actually, perhaps the most likely scenario is Russia maintaining control of the Donbass, the war in deep freeze, but just going on. Tragically and sadly, that could be the case. Now, of course. I don't know how far you want to extend this conversation, but if we believe that's going to be the scenario in Ukraine, it, it then for the rest of the West, and particularly other countries that border Russia, there is then the lingering threat of a resurgent and domineering Russia, which is why NATO at its summit quite recently has said that it wants to increase from 40,000 to 300,000 high readiness troops, not to fight the Russians, although troops must be trained and prepared to fight the Russians, but to deter the Russians from further aggression uh, elsewhere, whether it's in the Baltic states or Poland or, or wherever. And again, again, extending the conversation a bit more, it comes back to our domestic considerations. Um, under some pressure, the Prime Minister has now agreed to increase our defence budget to move towards 2.5% of GDP by the end of the decade. But, and here's another quite narrow point, but important point, we're still going ahead in this country with reducing our army by 10,000 troops over the next few years. Frankly, that's madness, because if NATO is going to go to 300,000 high readiness troops, we've got to play our part in that. And reducing our army further just makes no sense whatsoever. So domestically, we welcome the rise to 2.5% of GDP, but we must reverse the cuts in numbers to the army and also increase our investment in our army, our land war fighting capability. I'm afraid the future is not going to be a return to things pre 24th of February. The future is going to be a grumpy resurgent Russia on the borders of countries in Eastern Europe. And we've got to play our part in deterring further Russian aggression. That's interesting that you say that that cut to troop num numbers is madness. Um, how, what impact would it have on our defence capability? I mean, I guess in simple language, are we going to be less safe as a result? Well, we are, in land force terms, we are much less capable than we were 10 years ago. Um, 10, 15 years ago, we were fighting two difficult campaigns with our army in Iraq and Afghanistan and doing them simultaneously with an army of over 100,000. We're coming down to an army of 70 odd thousand and we could not maintain operations at the scale that we were doing 10, 15 years ago. Um, People say you shouldn't focus on the number, you should focus on capability. Well, in the case of our maritime and air forces, that is correct, because those services are platform based. You've got to have smart ships, you've got to have smart aircraft. But when it comes to old fashioned fighting, numbers do matter. And to have an army of only just over 70,000, 30% down from where we were 10 years ago, is going to leave us woefully short if we find that we've got to maintain large number of troops at high readiness forward deployed in Eastern Europe. Um, it's a mere fact of life. We'll, we'll break the remainder of our army if our army is not large enough, uh, trained well enough and equipped well enough to do what the government of the day wants us to do. You, you can't make people work endlessly um, with too small numbers. So numbers in the terms of our land forces really, really matter. Uh, it's fascinating to listen to you. Um... Now, this week, the former uh, National Security Advisor, Kim Darek, uh, said that NATO has to be ready for a Russian nuclear strike. Do you agree? And what does that mean? Well, the West is always ready to respond to a, a nuclear strike. Um, but let's not get carried away with, with this. We absolutely do not want to see anybody using nuclear weapons in Europe or elsewhere. Um, we all know from our history books what the awful consequence was of the two atom bombs uh, in Japan in 1945. Modern nuclear weapons are much more powerful than that. We don't even want to see a small tactical nuclear weapon being used. So um, I think Kim Derrick, it's perfectly reasonable to say what he has said, but we should be under no illusion that our British nuclear deterrent is always at high readiness. So is the United States ready to watch whatever Russia might or might not do. I think the thing that's really important here is to keep this conflict in Ukraine within the concept of what we would call a limited war, limited in geography uh, and limited by the means that are being used. And one of the limits is the tacit agreement 
that neither side will use nuclear weapons. They might say they're prepared to do so. What's really important is that our defenses are ready. And I think the other thing people have got to remember, perhaps be a little bit less fearful, is Vladimir Putin can't get up one morning and think, well, this is not going very well, I'm going to push the button. Even within the Russian nuclear firing chain, it requires a number of people to confirm that decision and confirm certain actions. So he can't just get out of bed in the morning and push a button. It's not as simple as that. But the um, important thing is that our defences are ready, but let's keep this below the nuclear threshold uh, and work it out in, I was going to say, a civilised way. Well, what the Russians are doing is not civilised, but in a at least a vaguely rational way. OK, I understood. Uh, very briefly, as we are out of time, but there is one more question I do want to squeeze in. We've seen, of course, um, these very upsetting stories about British uh, people being accused of being mercenaries uh, by Russia. Two more British men are captured by the Russians uh, and, again, accused of being mercenaries. Is there anything that the government can do in this situation? Well, I think they can make representations to uh, Russia through, through the Ukrainians, <clears throat> reminding that these are British citizens. But, but you know, um, if people, for their own reasons, decide to get themselves involved in somebody else's war, they've really got to take the consequences of, of their own actions. Now, that said, the death sentence being passed on to former British servicemen who have been held, um, that's really quite outrageous. Those, those two, for example, were properly enlisted in the Ukrainian army, and therefore they should be treated like prisoners of war, be they Ukrainian or, or be they British. Um, this whole business is most unfortunate, but I would certainly say to anybody that's thinking of, of going adventuring a little bit into Ukraine, be very, very careful. Um, this actually is not your fight, but if you find yourself uh, being taken prisoner by the Russians, then, frankly, um, it may be out of your control. It may be even out of the British government's hands. Thank you so much for being uh, on the programme this morning. It's been really interesting. I have certainly feel like I've learned something from the interview. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie.